and welcome to the top 10 most likely unseen issues video for the operational case study November 2017 where the company is Struins of Newland, the ice cream manufacturer. And in this video we're looking at the top 10 most likely unseen issues and what that means is these are the 10 things that I think are the most likely to come up in the November exam based on my knowledge of the pre-scene, what I've gone through in the pre-scene, my understanding of the company and my experience in the past uh, dealing with similar pre-seen companies. Okay, so the idea is this video is gonna help you to go into the exam with a bit of an understanding of what to expect. And one thing that's gonna do is to help you to prepare key models from the pre-seen information going straight into the exam. So for example, we've already uh, in the pre-scene, we've seen a SWOT analysis given by the company. There's an example of one model, but you might do your own SWOT analysis uh, of your own. You might want to do a Pestel analysis or for, uh, Porter's Five Forces. Uh, those kind of models do beforehand, so you have them ready and you have the benefit of that information ready to go into the exam. The other thing that's useful with this video is that we have a range of mock exams available written for each titting. So this time we'll have a series of mock exams written for Struens of Newland and our questions are based on our top 10 issues. So what we think is most likely to come up in the exam, those are the questions we write. And so our mock exams are unique in the sense that uh, it's, it's, a, it's our best guess at what you are likely to get when you come to sit the exam in November. Going into this as well, it helps if you can find relevant real life examples. And literally you can go out and find actual examples of similar companies. So other ice cream companies or confectionery companies that have had issues in the past few years. Use that as an example of something that might come up uh, for Struens in the Unseen exam. And then you already have the example there ready. Something that could really help you with this is our industry analysis. We have a document and a video available for that in which we have a series of 25 real life industry examples that can be applied uh, in the unseen exam. For any given issue, it's useful to learn the typical key points. So for instance, if you have a question that comes up on uh, costing or budgeting methods, then you can learn the typical advantages of absorption costing, disadvantages of absorption costing, the advantages of uh, activity-based costing, disadvantages of it. And as long as you're applying that to the scenario, not just you know, reciting uh, in a book like rote information, you do have to make sure you're applying it, then there's, there's easy things that you can, you can take into the exam and get marks for. Knowing the issues also helps you to be prepared for which models you can use to support the issue. So for example, uh, if you have a question on um, financing or fi uh, financing a new project, then you can go into it um, knowing that this is likely to come up and you'll go in ahead and research or just study, make sure you're up to date on things like um, how to raise short-term finance, what kind of methods there are for raising short-term finance, the different financing um, strategies such as aggressive, conservative, matching, all those kind of things. Knowing what the issues are likely to be helps you narrow down what it is you need to study uh, in order to prepare for this exam. Okay, so for each, cho each of the top 10 issues that I've chosen, I'm gonna justify my choice and my uh, the reasoning why I've decided to include this in the top 10. And these are generally the, the reasons I use for the basis of my choice. So number one is the focus on the pre-scene. If an issue is, seems to come up again and again in the pre-scene, so for example, in this case, one issue that has come up again and again is the fact that the, the market is uh, changing and potentially change towards a more um, a health conscious uh, part of the market. People are more concerned about health in their ice cream. And so that issue has come up again and again. And for, so that might be included in the top 10 because it's come up in the pre-scene repeatedly. We're also gonna be considering the degree of importance attached by the examiner. So for example, the health consciousness example might not be that important for the examiner, but something like the working capital management. So in this case, the working capital of the company, the working capital cycles increased 
that's a more examinable topic and so that might be something that the examiner thinks is important and thus it's more likely to appear in the exam. Other reasons for the basis of my choice, there's a strategic element to consider, so whether or not it's important to a SWOT analysis. There is a SWOT analysis given in the pre-scene itself. We'll be doing one separately in the strategic analysis video. But uh, if it's one of the things that's been highlighted in the SWOT analysis, then again, it's more likely, I think, to come up in the exam. And so that's a reason why I would have included it in these top 10. Equally, uh, if you're not talking about the SWOT analysis, you think about it from this perspective of the directors or some of the key stakeholders and think what uh, what are the main issues that they're going to be concerned about. And again, that will influence my decision for these top 10. And in addition to that, we're going to go on my experience. So I've dealt with uh, the case operational case study at Astranti for the past year now, and I've been involved in case study exams since their inception. Uh, back in 2015. I know what kind of things come up. I know what kind of problems SEMA deliberately write in to the companies uh, that allow them to examine those uh, sort of troubling areas. So I, I have a lot of experience with case studies and generally uh, I know when you read a pre-scene you can say okay they've deliberately uh, have an issue here. There's a pretty good chance that they're going to want to do an exam question on that because remember there are several different variants and so SEMA have to write a lot of different questions so they have to leave plenty of uh, troublesome areas within the company for them to write questions on. And, uh, my job in this video is to try and narrow that focus down so you know going into the exam what the main areas of uh, examinable topics are going to be. Okay, so let's make a start then and look at the first issue. Now, just a quick note at the top, these issues aren't necessarily in order from least important to most important or least likely to most likely. They are just 10 issues that I think are likely to come up in no particular order. Issue number 10, the first one we look at then, is going to be risk management. So the reason why I've chosen this is because it is, of course, a key P1 topic. And obviously, as a major P1 topic, in the operational case study, uh, this is one of the areas that um, SEMA want to examine you on to make sure that you are have a good understanding of that area and are able to apply it to a scenario. So key parts of the syllabus are the identify and identification of risks. Are you able to look at a scenario and see where the risky elements are? Once you've identified the risks, are you able to suggest risk management techniques to understand the techniques that are appropriate for various risks and also what kind of controls are you going to put in place. So those are three really important areas of the P1 syllabus which makes it kind of quite likely to come up in the exam in some form of an, uh, or another. It's been examined recently and it's examined regu regularly so it always comes up in some variant of one form or the other. It's just too important to miss out. So you can, you can expect a risk management question somewhere. Now, risk management is obviously a broad topic, so we can't be too specific, but trying to narrow it down, some of the likely areas that you might be examined on risk management uh, would probably be on a project. So a new project or a new investment, there may be questions over how risky the new investment or our project is. So for instance, if Struans want to go into um, pro uh, producing a single serving ice cream, you might get a question on you know the associated risks with going into that new line for a product that they hadn't previously done. Otherwise it could be more general, it could be just risks identified based on the pre-scene alone. So for example there you might be getting um, the risks, some of the risks we identified in pre-scene. So perhaps the fact that the finance department uh, is a small department, they have a lot of pressure, responsibility, accountability for just four people. Uh, the fact that the finance department also has IT and HR sort of put into it as well means that it's probably an overburdened department. So there's risks obviously associated with that. So that there, there might be one of the risks that comes up based on just looking at the problems from looking at the pre-scene. In addition to that, you might get questions on how risk should be managed. So the kind of the company's approach to risk management, perhaps 
uh, using the COSO risk methodology, which is kind of the framework for you know risk management in enterprises. Um, there might be something to do with the role of an audit committee or whether in fact there is an audit committee at all. Obviously uh, in this exam, in this pre-scene for Struens, there is no mention of an audit committee. It doesn't mean one doesn't exist, but um, the lack of information on that means that it's possible that you know there could be areas uh, where risk management uh, is being overlooked. And so the, uh, the creation of an audit committee might be a solution to this. And also we need to be thinking about the culture. So how should risk be managed based on the culture at the company? So, um, you know, Struens have a fairly, it's a small operation, small company, family run. So that's going to have an impact on their approach to risk management. Okay, so some of the key risks that we can identify from having looked through the pre-scene, one major one for me was the decline in bulk sales. There were several pages on industry information and kind of market analysis given in the pre-scene. And one of the major take-homes from that is that the sales of bulk sales of ice cream uh, are on the decrease. Obviously, this is pretty bad news for Struens because they only actually sell bulk ice cream at the moment they have no they sell no single servings or any of the other kinds of ice cream they're all entirely dependent on bulk sales and at the moment those sales are on the decline so there's a key risk straight away another pre-scene related risk is the lack of diversification in their products as we've already mentioned they only sell bulk sales but they are they're only really doing one kind of ice cream and indeed the fact that they only do ice cream, given the fact that they have their own dairy farm, there's lots of other milk products they could be doing. They could be doing, uh, you know, milk on its own, milkshakes, ver uh, milk powder, various milk-based products for the production of other consumables to uh, other companies. So there's lots of different things they could be doing, but they aren't. So there's a real lack of diversification of products and services in the company at the moment. Another risk for the company is the threat of new entrants. We've uh, been told in the pre-scene repeatedly about the discount supermarkets that are coming in offering these luxury brands at a sort of competitive price and they have been seeing the biggest uh, growth in, in the industry in the past year and so the growth of that the continued growth of discount supermarkets uh, face uh, represents a challenge for Struens as obviously they're going to be taking away some uh, a part of the market share decreasing Struens's market share overall. Okay, so if you get a question on risks or what kind of risks, what the major risks facing the company, there are three that you could certainly bring up and they're definitely major risks that need to be identified. If the question is slightly different, if it's about approaches to managing risk, then as we've said, you would want to emphasize the importance of the embedded risk methodology and using that framework in order to uh, manage the risk you know, that your company faces. Uh, you want to also ma mention the fact that risk management uh, is very important at all levels and operational level is no exception to that. Even though risk management can sometimes be thought of as a high level strategic thing, it's important to implement risk management at all levels. And so that's certainly something you would want to mention, uh, particularly as this is an operational level exam. And if you are asked on how to control risks, then make sure you do so explain if a risk comes up, uh, how you will use a methodology, perhaps how you use the embedded risk methodology to mitigate or manage the risk. Okay, so that's issue number 10, our first issue, and that is risk management. The next issue that I've highlighted as a likely issue is governance. So the thinking behind this one then is the fact that we have a small family business and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, uh, but it does mean that they will have grown organically over time. The business is passed on from generation to generation. All of this happening without any kind of, you know, formal uh, analysis of the company's governance, the way it's managed and all, all that side of things may have been overlooked due to its uh, size. In addition to that, it's of course an important issue for any company. So even if it were a you know a fully listed uh, corporate 
entity that has was sort of had all this uh, corporate governance approach that doesn't mean they can overlook governance and things have to be done uh, by the book and in addition to that and perhaps related to the first point the fact that we have all the directors are siblings now again there's nothing necessarily wrong with that there's no reason why uh, a business can't be professional just because there's family members there but it does raise the uh, question of you know if if uh, if something does happen, if there's a fallout or a disagreement, uh, are things going? Are the directors going to be slightly less professional because they are, in fact, family members and may take things more personally? And of course, the fact that the directors are all siblings does also raise the question uh, of questions around nepotism and cronyism, whether the people got the job because they were the best at the job or whether they got the job because. They were family members. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, promoting family members so long as they are able to do the job. So likely issues given the pre-scene uh, could be a dispute between the key management. So perhaps the fact that one of the brothers is the managing directors. Um, some of the other directors, are they're all siblings and some of them are reporting to him. So there might, there might be kind of uh, some uh, tension there. Uh, something that has come up in the past is the company needs to prepare for an external audit and they haven't really been keeping check on their governance, making sure they're, they're, everything is in order. So suddenly finding themselves in a position where they need to review governance uh, in, in the light of an external audit coming up. There might be concerns about governance from the investors and the shareholders, people who are putting their money in the company. The directors are running the company on behalf of the shareholders. And the shareholders may have concerns over the way that the company is being run uh, at the moment. Now, we, there isn't much information given about who the shareholders are. We can assume it's mostly family members. And so uh, the concerns uh, may not may not um, instantiate from in this area. Uh, another thing could be the setting up of an internal committee. So uh, such as an, uh, an audit committee or um, nominations committee or whatever it might be. Uh, there may be a call for internal committees just to keep uh, the company in check and make sure that certain areas of the, the governance of the country, company, the management of the company is done properly and to, to the best standards. Okay, so if you get a question on governance, some of the key things to bear in mind when answering your questions, is the fact that governance is obviously essential to any successful business and even or particularly a family business can't afford to overlook their governance just because it is perhaps a more formal or informal arrangement. There are, of course, legal requirements for any kind of um, incorporated entity or limited entity. There are certain legal requirements with regards to, uh, uh, to governance. And obviously, public companies must meet certain standards too. So if the company ever did want to go public, start selling shares on the stock market or the stock exchange, then there are certain standards that it would have to meet and it would be useful for uh, them to implement them early. So when it comes to listing themselves, there isn't a huge uh, change required at the company regarding their governance. Okay, so that's governance. That's a, that's a fairly popular one that does come up in the, in the exam sometimes. And in this case, I think it's more likely given the nature of the business. All that remains for me to say is thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And I'll just take a few moments of your time if I could to just tell you about some of the other case, stu case study materials that we offer. So one of the things is a study text. Now this is a study text specifically aimed at the case study and we have one for each level. So we have an operational management and strategic level one and they're designed to help you pass the study. They're in two halves. The first half is exam tips and this exam strategy and advice on how to answer questions and all the really useful kind of tips that you need going into these exams and how to prepare for them. And then the second half, the second part of those is a recap of the key theory that always comes up in the case studies again and again. So those are really useful, really valuable thing that you can get. Uh, those are available online and you can get the, an actual textbook, a print physical textbook for the old fashioned among you who like to do it that way still. 
Uh, we also have course videos that correspond uh, with that study text as well. So we have a series of really nicely well produced, well done videos uh, in which we basically take you through exactly what's involved in the case study and how you can uh, spend your time preparing for it to ensure that you get really good marks. It's really, really great um, series of videos there. We've got the pre-scene analysis, which the video you just watched is an example of the pre-scene analysis. And there'll be several more videos just like that, where we look at every, every tiny detail of the pre-scene and we relate it back to the, the P1 or F1 or E1 and we relate it to real life scenarios, relate it to uh, actual business and analysis tools. And we give you the, um, what we expect to be the top 10 issues. Another thing that we do is slightly different is the industry analysis. And that is a really, this is a really great document in which we basically cover everything um, that's relevant to the industry for the particular business that we're looking at. And it goes from the history through to the, the customers and suppliers and the market and how the market has functioned and the history of that. And we've got statistics in there and diagrams and it's full of information. It's so, so useful. And at the end of that pack, we also have 25 actual industry examples. So real life things that have happened in that industry that um, kind of examples of things that might actually happen to this, uh, to the company in the exam. So it gives you a sense of the kind of things that are going on in the industry and how real life businesses in that industry have coped with it. We have mock exams, which are, if you were gonna pick any one of these, to do, I would suggest it was the mock exams because nothing prepares you for the exam more than actually sitting a mock exam. And if I were if I were a student taking this, I would certainly put mock exams at the top of my list, along with marking and feedback. Now, our mock exams are actually um, designed to match the way that the actual SEMA exams are, so you can sit them on your laptop and they'll be timed and automatic, and they are as close as you are going to get to the real thing. And you can get marking and feedback on that as well, which is probably the most invalu uh, valuable thing you could probably get to get specific feedback from uh, from a marker who is, deals with this exam four times a year. That's the best way for you to improve your uh, your ability to pass this exam uh, as quickly as possible. We also have a masterclass. So as an online company, we hold an online masterclass, which you can sign up for and it's a, um, a day over, over the weekend. We do the Saturday and a Sunday, and it's, it's a full day's worth of a, we have an expert who, who takes an online seminar and we go through everything um, specific to that case study that you can do to get prepared for the exam. And we cover all sorts, and it's very, very popular among students who like a one-on-one -on -one kind of classroom environment um, in, an online, in an online situation. We also offer pass guarantee. So if you do, uh, if you're unlucky enough to not uh, pass your exam the first time round, then there's no worries because we give you the option. If you if you choose a pass guarantee option, then if, as long as you hit all the basic, all the all the minimum requirements that we ask, and you don't pass, then you get uh, you get access to our materials for the next sitting, uh, completely free of charge. So there's there's something that we're doing to try and to try and get you. Um, hopefully, if you if you signed up to our course and you do everything that we say you should do, then you probably will pass first time. That tends to be the way it goes. But if you should be unfortunate, if it's a particularly tough exam, then we'll let you have another go um, for free. So that's it. Thanks again for watching. Remember, my name is James. You can find me on Facebook. James Nutting Astranti, where I'll be posting all sorts of information about the upcoming exam. Make sure you check that out um, because there's always something to talk about with regards to that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.